take my Weezer mask off. <laughs> and I'm not afraid of this, so. <laughs> Um, and I, I do have to point out that I love everyone's like prepared stories and they're like all put together and I've got like pretty notes <laughs> so uh, get excited a little background on me just like Sarah I gotta, gotta provide a little bit of information before we get into this so my name is Jamie Hill for those of you who I've not yet met I am the operations director at the Kenworthy so if you live in Moscow odds are pretty stinking good that you've heard of the Kenworthy something. The Kenworthy Plaza, the Kenworthy Building, the Kenworthy Theater, the Kenworthy Drive-In, all the Kenworthy things. And if you've been to the Kenworthy, you've probably heard about Milburn. Milburn is our good friend. We love him. Uh, and if you work at the Kenworthy, you learn all about his antics and his business savvy. And he was just a really stinking cool guy. I wish that I could have met him. Anyone who ends up in a book about Moscow, like, leaning over a table with a gun. <laughs> like, that's just classy. That is just straight up old school classy. <laughs> Other thing you should know about me is that I grew up in a really small town, uh, Weezer. How many people have been to Weezer? And I, when I say been, I mean like not, I drove through it. <laughs> been to Weezer. Okay, still some hair. <laughs> Uh, Weezer is pretty tiny. If you chart out our population from 1890 census till now, it looks like this. <laughs> it's, it, it's been the same for years. Um, currently, we're sitting at about 5,000 people. Um, I think when I officially changed my address, like the whole town knew about it. They also knew my new address, which was really scary. But growing up in a small town, you have a different point of view about the world. And instead of um, learning new things and, and bringing them into your world, you use your own world to compare to other things. So coming to Moscow and learning about Milburn, I realized I've grown up with a Milburn in my life since I was a small child, and his name was Frank Mortimer. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about Frank Mortimer, the Milburn Kenworthy of Weezer. <laughs> Frank Mortimer was born in 1874 in Indiana. You know how history was back then. He was from Indiana, question mark. He was born in a month in 1874. Nobody really knows. And just like anybody who's worthy of a story uh, from long, long ago, he has a whole resume of things that he probably did. He was allegedly a pro baseball player in Chicago. Um, he allegedly traveled with the circus as a young child and a teenager. We'll get back to that. Um, and allegedly at 17, he worked in a Chicago publishing plant and developed an amazing shipping room receiving system that was so handy that they still use it today. When I was 17, I was like eating ice cream <laughs> and not caring about anything. So Frank decided to join the circus, like all kids actually ran away with the circus. He was a juggler. He juggled battle axes. He juggled knives. He juggled lightning balls which are literally just these little metal balls that they would light on fire and just play with. Because why not? Uh, and he loved it. He traveled all across the country. By the time he hit Weezer with his troop, they ended up disbanding when they hit Weezer. I, I'll just say that was a coincidence. Um, but he liked it so much, he was 21 years old, and he thought, why not set up a life here in this quaint little town? He did his act, even though the rest of his friends left him, he still kept doing his act. And the whole town was talking about Frank Mortimer. He was mesmerizing. They said that he had a straight act of rapid and smooth manipulation with no sparring for time. This was not the vaudevillian who was gonna get up there and like fool you with words. You just straight up watched him and you were amazed. He also, of course, like all good boys in the, the early 1900s was a clerk. Who wasn't? He was a bartender. <laughs> Who hasn't been? Um, and five years after moving to town, he ended up buying the local newspaper, something that had been in, uh, in business since before he was born. Took it up and ran it for 30 years because he recognized if you're going to be an entertainer, you got to tell people about it. And it's cheaper to tell them about it if you own the newspaper. <laughs> what a thinker. <laughs> So the thing that, that Frank is really known for is the island. Uh, in 1910, he purchased the island um, relatively soon after the newspaper. He took some time. Um, Weezer was a rough and wild place, and when I say was, I mean 
yesterday. Uh, so he developed this island, he cleared it up, he cleaned it up, and July 4th of 1919, he opened uh, what he called the Oregon Trail Park. Now, living in Weezer, again, it, everything is about the Oregon Trail. We're not even in Oregon. We're like 30 miles from the closest alleged trail point, <laughs> but we're on it, guys. <laughs> super, super famous. So Frank buys this island uh, right at the convergence of the Snake and the Weezer Rivers, and he cleans it up. The island cost him $2,000, and it's this beautiful, picturesque view on the water right across from the United Pacific Railroad Depot. So prime location. Everyone knows where it is, but it's been wilderness, so he's ready to turn this into like the entertainment venue. He renovates the whole thing, he adds electric lighting everywhere, and his island quickly becomes known as the Island of a Thousand Lights. In high school, I remember learning about the World's Expo, the one with H.H. H. Holmes, the serial killer in Chicago, um, and everybody knows it as like the, the, the white city or like the city of lights, there's this huge thing, they flipped the light switch and it all turned on. I remember learning that in high school and thinking, Oh, it's just like the island! <laughs> in reality, it's probably a little different. Uh, his little dinky $2,000 plot of land probably had nothing on the wattage there. But yet, he still opened it. He created a huge double arch entryway with a huge sign that said, Leave care behind, all ye who enter here. The only thing that mattered to Frank was that you were entertained, that you had a good time, and that everything else, just leave it in Weezer, come over, leave your cares there, and just have a good time. Uh, so when he opened for his July 4th big celebration, there were fireworks, there was dancing. He'd been planning for this for some time, and he'd been in Weezer for some time at that point, about 10, 15 years, and he didn't realize that the Weezer City Band, who had closed, uh, shut down their, their activities a year before, uh, during, I don't know, this weird pandemic thing that was happening. He thought they just quit playing music, but they'd actually been preparing in secret. They showed up at the island to celebrate and they played for an hour for all of his 3,000 guests. The day that the island opened, the town's population was 3,154. <laughs> and there was definitely over 3,000 people in attendance. So either a couple kids stayed home or we're, I mean, we're talking somebody can't count, <laughs> because there's clearly no other option. Admission to the party was uh, between 10 and 15 cents, and Frank's wife just stood at those gates with that big sign and took tickets and greeted everyone as they came in, and everyone really understood this to be Frank's island, for sure, um, and he kept calling it the Oregon Trail Park and trying to make it this big community place, but everybody knew that it was, it was really Frank's. The island, um, in its second year, the businessmen of Weezer, and maybe secretly the businesswomen, uh, all got together. They were so proud of Frank and his work that they actually rented out a full page ad in the Weezer newspaper to congratulate Frank on really owning and creating the pride and the delight of the city. They were all so glad to have it. Weezer was a happening place. We had three theaters. We had people coming from all over. And this tiny little island, this little entertainment mecca, was bringing tens of thousands of people to Weezer. Boise ended up um, changing their depot schedule to fit Weezer's depot schedule. <laughs> they added extra trains, they added extra traffic. Everything was funneling to Weezer to go to this island. The island included an outdoor theater for the moving pictures, a pavilion, a dance hall, and a merry-go-round, which was um, the largest in the Northwest. Now, I know that some people debate about merry-go-rounds. Um, I think it's like, if it's a carousel versus a merry-go-round, um, it's like if it has white or colored lights, or some people say that it's, uh, that, some, that a carousel goes clockwise and a merry-go-round goes anti-clockwise, weird. Um, or my, uh, my boss tells me that a carousel has horses and a merry-go-round has animals. <laughs> Whatever it really is, uh, Frank's thing that was very large had horses, and it was really pretty. Um, for Frank, he, he wanted the island to be open to everyone. It was really important to him that he was providing access for everyone. It was just as much a community service to him as it was a source of income, which is why he never really raised ticket prices. 
He would often do community events for free. He would allow people to use the island for church services on the waterfront. He would allow conventions to come to town. He'd allow revivals to come to town, maybe not for like a year. That's, that's not, there's too much dancing for that. Um, and, and then of course, personally, my favorite thing was that he developed this outdoor movie theater in this island of lights outside. Um, it was said in, a, in an article about him that there was an extravagance of lights that glowed on the backside of the balcony, illuminating the grounds at night and yet not interfering with the moving picture, which as a projectionist, that makes my heart so ridiculously <laughs> happy. Uh, the other thing that I, I love about the history of the island is um, that all of the community events um, became really well known as these annual traditions while the island was running. And again, it, it just reflects so much of back to Moscow and what we have. There was an Odd Fellows picnic every year. One year they proudly served 35 gallons of homemade ice cream. <laughs> sounds a lot like something that happens right here on this lawn. Um, though 35 gallons sounds a little weak to me. I don't know. <laughs> um, so uh, Frank Mortimer ran his island um, as long as he could. Unfortunately, the 30s hit, the depression hit, and people weren't really interested in outdoor recreation and they weren't really interested in paying, you know, 15 cents to 25 cents to go to a show. That was just not really feasible. And there were other theaters in town that were more affordable. So the island kind of fell out of fashion and was just left alone. Uh, the pavilion eventually was turned into a roller rink that disappeared in the 60s. And by disappeared, I mean the floor just fell to the dirt and it was left where it was. Um, Frank tried to stay busy. He tried to mine more out of his life and literally bought a mine just outside <laughs> of town uh, in the 40s after his wife had died and he found lots of copper as well as a bunch of radioactive material that he thought could be good for studying. <laughs> Strangely, maybe related, maybe not. Um, he passed away. He would go visit his sister every year like a good brother should uh, in California. And while he was down there, he got sick and passed away in 1957. But in his will, he left the island to this city. And uh, it, it really harkens to, to my love of Milburn Kenworthy and the Kenworthy family's gift is a place that I get to enjoy every day, um, which is so great compared to the island, which was the gift for my hometown. Um, it's not quite the same now. It has been cleaned up. The place where the dance hall stood is our water treatment plant. <laughs> so the kids still go there for school <laughs> tours, but uh, not quite the same as when we go tour the old um, institute and college in town. Um, and poor Frank, he, while he died in California, he did get brought back to Weezer, um, and he is interred at our cemetery, but he doesn't even have a headstone. His wife has a really nice one, and he has a little marker that has the year and his name on it. Um, and that's something that I'm hoping to change in the next couple of years with the help of Weezer, because like Moscow, we are a tight community. When we want to get something done, we're going to get it done. Uh, so that's the story of Frank Mortimer, and what is now affectionately known in my hometown as Mortimer's Island.